charting your next steps in the practice of authentic allyship. It all really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. From his book, The Trumpet of Conscience. We are born, live, and die as part of a beautiful planet. We are not, as some would imagine, separate from it. We are part of it. The rivers of our blood flow with the waters of our rivers and streams. The soil, sun, air, and rain form the food that makes up our bodies. We are also part of larger social structures. They existed before we were born, and they shape much of our experience as human beings. Our mother tongue not only helps us to find common words for things, but shapes how we see them. Allyship is all about recognizing that these social structures, while providing much that sustains our life, have developed and in many cases were constructed to benefit some and disadvantage others. Allyship is all about working to change these social structures, following the lead of those who have been most impacted by the inequities and injustices that exist. When we are part of a group that is more likely to benefit from that system, we have some serious and difficult work to do to recognize these inequities and injustices and work to change them. It is totally human to find ourselves responding with denial, despair, guilt, and or shame. It is totally human to see this at work in other people. As Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, however, we are all interrelated. Unjust systems in the end impact everyone negatively. They hold everyone back. They divide us from one another and thus tear the fabric of our common humanity. By taking this course, you have decided to take a step toward standing with those most impacted by the injustices and inequities of our current social system. You want to work to make real, lasting change. Some say that before you do that work with others, you need to get yourself straight first. There is some truth to this. The problem is that people often work on themselves to the exclusion of working with others, working on institutions or larger structures. Often this is because people in Western societies, people impacted by white culture, tend to think of the individual as the only unit of human being that matters. This denies the interrelatedness of human beings to the earth and to one another. This point of view rarely leads to the kind of change that would matter in the lives of our BIPOC siblings. At Paths to Understanding, we would offer a different approach. We have found that working in all four locations of our social structures at the same time is the most beneficial to producing real and lasting change. We understand that human beings experience racism or oppression and also liberation and healing within ourselves, that is intrapersonally, in relationship with others interpersonally, in the way organizations or groups work institutionally, in the patterns of the economy, culture, and national narratives, that is structurally. We see that for true peace, liberation and healing is needed in each of these locations. To move toward liberation and healing can begin in any one of these locations. Each of these locations informs and influences the others. Work we may take in part of some kind of institutional or structural change can lead to work in our interpersonal or interpersonal relationships. Work we do with ourselves can lead to change in our work on institutions and so on. In my work of authentic allyship with the Muslim community, I have found insights that have changed the way I relate to myself and to others. Work on my own self-care and spirituality 
has changed the way I do my public work. Here is an example. In 2017, I was asked to organize a public event to counter a dehumanization campaign against Muslims by a wealthy man in Muckleteo, Washington. Two days before the event, the first Muslim ban was announced by the Trump administration. There was a sense of potential danger leading up to that event. As I arrived, men in big trucks were roaring through the parking lot, and yes, they did have truck nuts. We found that members of an anti-Muslim hate group were there to disrupt the event. There were people in the crowd with what I often call super frowny faces. Our security people, and yes, we had to have security, removed several people from the event as they were disrupting it. As a white Christian male pastor, I had never experienced such a sense of danger in my life. For the next five months, I had to have a bottle of water with me whenever I spoke in public. My body, you see, was having a reaction to the stress, and that led to my mouth being dry. I sought out the advice of friends and mentors. I saw a therapist for a while. I did some prayer and meditation. I reflected on my own tradition and the way Jesus lived with himself and taught about the risk of public leadership. As far as I knew, I would always have to have a bottle of water with me when I spoke in public. Then one day we held an event, and I realized I didn't need the water. Work in public had led to growth in my intrapersonal life that then led to growth in my public work. This didn't mean that I wasn't concerned or even anxious. It just meant that I had incorporated that risk more fully into my life. It also humbled me. The fact is that my Muslim partners, BIPOC people, face a sense of excessive, unnecessary, and unjust danger every single day. This led me to be more compassionate toward them in my interpersonal relationships. This led me to be motivated to work harder for institutional and structural change. The work of authentic allyship will create growth opportunities within all four locations of your human social experience. This growth will often include discomfort and even pain, but it is worth it. So the question is, what next steps practically are you going to take in each of these four locations? We invite you to review the worksheet included in this lesson and begin to plan some concrete next steps in each one. Such small steps along the journey of life can lead when we all work together for the kind of society we long for, incredible change. We offer these statements by famous folk as encouragement for you along the way. I still believe that one day humankind will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed, and nonviolent redemptive goodwill will proclaim the rule of the land. Most of these people will never make the headlines, and their names will not appear in who's who. Yet when years have rolled past, and when the blazing light of truth is focused on this marvelous age in which we live, Men and women will know and children will be taught that we have a finer land, a better people, a more noble civilization, because these humble children of God were willing to suffer for righteousness' sake. Nelson Mandela, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1964. Cautious, careful people, always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing, never can bring about a reform. Those who are really in earnest must be willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation, and publicly and privately, in season and out, avow their sympathy with despised and persecuted ideas and their advocates, and bear the consequences. Susan B. Anthony 
Why do people find the courage to live divided no more when they know they will be punished for it? The answer I have seen in the lives of people like Rosa Parks is simple. These people have transformed the notion of punishment itself. They have come to understand that no punishment anyone might inflict on them could possibly be worse than the punishment they inflict on themselves by conspiring in their own diminishment. Parker J. Palmer from Let Your Life Speak. I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Rosa Parks. We must draw lessons from the experiences we gained. If we look back at the last century, the most devastating cause of human suffering has been the culture of violence in resolving differences and conflicts. The challenge before us, therefore, is to make this new 21st century a century of dialogue when conflicts are resolved nonviolently. In human societies, there will always be differences of opinions and interests. However, the reality today is that we are all interdependent and have to coexist with one another on this small planet. As a result, the only sensible and intelligent way to resolving differences and clash of interests today, whether between individual communities or nations, is through dialogue in the spirit of compromise and reconciliation. We need to research, develop, and teach this spirit of nonviolence and invest in these efforts as much resources as we do for military defense. The Dalai Lama, this is on March 22nd, on the 43rd anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising Day. So what next steps are you going to take? We'll be interested to find out when we come to our live session this next week. 